turns to this man for leadership. I face the National Democratic Convention in Chicago last July when I was nominated for Vice President of the United States under my protest. A terrible ordeal, I thought. I shall attempt, as I have attempted in these other crises, to meet your expectations. But don't expect too much of me. I must have your help and your support. His name is Harry Truman, and this is his biography. Harry S. Truman. In September of 1944, Senator Truman, candidate for Vice President of the United States, was strolling past the White House with a friend. The man turned to him and said, Harry, somehow I have a hunch you're going to be living in that house before long. And Truman earnestly answered, I'm afraid I am, and it scares me. A president of these United States, one who is endowed with the intellectual boldness of Thomas Jefferson, the indomitable courage of Andrew Jackson, the faith and patience of Abraham Lincoln, the rugged integrity of Grover Cleveland, and the scholarly vision of Woodrow Wilson. Franklin Delano Roosevelt. A 1944 Democratic National Convention nominated Franklin Delano Roosevelt for his fourth term as president. The choice of a candidate for vice president seemed assured when Senator Samuel Jackson, the convention chairman, offered this nomination. A man who in writing Franklin Delano Roosevelt said if I were a delegate to this convention, I would vote for Henry A. Wallace. Henry Wallace had already served one term as vice president. And as the first roll call was completed, most delegates were sure that Wallace would be nominated again. 98. Truman, 319 and one half. O'Manny, 27. Wallace, 429 and one half. But despite Roosevelt's public gesture of support for Wallace, the leaders of the Democratic Party knew that the president preferred not to run again with the controversial man from Iowa. With Roosevelt's approval, support was being lined up for a Missouri senator named Harry Truman. Privately, Harry Truman was told that the president wanted him as a running mate. I was stunned, he said. I didn't want the nomination. I didn't want to leave the Senate. But I told them I would do what the president wanted. Party leaders finally gathered enough delegate support for Truman to get him the nomination. And uh, there being 1,176 qualified votes, of which Senator Harry Truman has received more than a majority, I do now declare him to be the nominee of the Democratic Party for Vice President and the next Vice President. Accepting the congratulations of fellow Democrats, Truman seemed somewhat lost in the giant spotlight of the national political arena. Give me a chance, will you please? 
been my privilege to be a United States Senator for the past nine and one and a half years, and I expect to continue the effort which I've been making in that uh, capacity as a United States Senator to help shorten the war and win the peace under the direction of the great, our great leader, Franklin D. Roosevelt. many Americans had never heard of Senator Harry Truman before this convention, and even one of FDR's closest associates had to ask the president, who is Harry Truman? Born in 1884, Harry Truman is a descendant of the pioneers who helped to settle the Missouri countryside near Kansas City. He is a shy child, prefers helping his mother with household chores to playing with other youngsters. At 13, he is fascinated by military heroes and spends most of his time reading about their exploits. His one ambition is to become a soldier. When he is rejected by West Point because of his poor eyesight, he joins up as a part-time soldier with the Missouri National Guard. He volunteers for active duty when the United States enters World War I and the war gives him a chance to fulfill his ambition to become a soldier. In France, he becomes a captain, and he commands Battery D of the 129th Field Artillery. His men learn that despite his bookish appearance, he is a tough, salty leader who isn't afraid to take chances. He sees Battery D safely through some of the hardest fighting of World War I. After the war, Harry Truman invests all his savings in a men's clothing store in Kansas City. But the venture fails, and at the age of 38, Truman must search for a new career. He tries his hand at small-town politics, and supported by the Pendergast political machine, he wins a term as a county official. He supervises the rebuilding of the county road system and earns a reputation as an honest, energetic administrator. After 12 years in local politics, he runs for the United States Senate in 1934. He has the backing of Kansas City boss Tom Pendergast, and he wins the election. I'll do my best, says Truman, to keep my feet on the ground. And in Washington, he follows the custom of most freshman senators. He's seen, but rarely heard. His voting record follows President Roosevelt's New Deal line to the letter. In six years, he chalks up no outstanding achievements, makes no headlines. He seems content to remain in the background of Washington affairs. He's happiest when he can spend time at home with his wife and their daughter, Margaret. father, Truman admits that he spoils his daughter. In 1941, and without fanfare, Truman organizes a special Senate committee to investigate waste and mismanagement in the national defense program. The senator from Missouri surprises his colleagues by displaying a sharp administrative sense. His committee helped save the government billions of dollars. And for the first time in his career, Harry Truman receives a measure of national recognition. The big drain on the government is the cost of relief. It must be curtailed to avoid increased taxes on everybody. With conditions improving, relief can gradually be cut to help only those actually in need until they can help themselves. This is the man Franklin Roosevelt picks out of the Senate to be his running mate in the 1944 campaign. The modest, retiring senator who describes himself as a Missouri country boy seems lost in the shadow of FDR's dominating personality. But the president is a shrewd politician. He knows that Truman's popularity in the Senate can be invaluable when it comes to lining up support for administration bills. four elections give Harry Truman his first taste of national campaigning. His mechanical speaking style lacks warmth. Truman's innate good humor, his sincere desire to be liked, aren't apparent to his audiences. One reporter remarks, as a vice presidential candidate from coast to coast, he laid one egg after another. 
On November 7th, 1944, Franklin Delano Roosevelt is elected to his fourth term. Harry Truman is carried along with him. Just 10 years before, Truman had arrived in Washington as a freshman senator, saying, I'm as ignorant as a fool about everything worth knowing. April 12th, 1945, 4.35 p.m. Vice President Harry Truman presides over a Senate meeting. He is unaware that at Warm Springs, Georgia, the President of the United States has suddenly died in his sleep. Within four hours, Harry Truman takes the oath of the nation's highest office. The moon, the stars, and all the planets fell on me, he says. If you ever pray, pray for me. before his former Senate colleagues. He is now Mr. President. With great humility, I call upon all Americans to help me keep our nation united in defense of those ideals which have been so eloquently proclaimed by Franklin Roosevelt. Overnight, Harry Truman must learn how to become a president. He is deluged by official reports, suggestions, and outlines of Roosevelt's plans. The war in Europe is drawing to a close. Just two weeks after Harry Truman takes office, American and Russian units join up at the Elba River. In two more weeks, Hitler's Third Reich will finally fall. In July of 1945, Harry Truman arrives in Germany to attend the Potsdam Conference. It is his first taste of international diplomacy, his first face-to-face -face meeting with Winston Churchill and Joseph Stalin. Truman compares Stalin to an old-time political boss. Blunt and demanding at the conference table, the Soviet dictator brushes off a request for cooperation in the recently established United Nations. He will not even discuss the question of freedom for Eastern European nations. Behind their official smiles, there is a growing hostility between Truman and Stalin. While at Potsdam, Truman learns that the Manhattan Project has successfully tested the first atomic bomb. Now, he alone must decide whether this terrifying weapon will be used against Japan. Harry Truman makes the most critical decision of his life. He issues the order, use the bomb. acceptance of the Potsdam Declaration, which specifies the unconditional surrender of Japan. In the reply, there is no qualification. Arrangements are now being made for the formal signing of the surrender terms at the earliest possible moment. General Douglas MacArthur has been appointed the Supreme Allied Commander to receive the Japanese surrender.
average man, open, uncomplicated, and without the traditional reserve expected of a president. A strike paralyzes the nation's railroads. For the first time, the American people hear an angry Harry Truman. He lashes out at the union leaders who called the walkout. As President of the United States, I am the representative of 140 million people. And I cannot stand idly by while they are being caused to suffer by reason of the action of two men. This is no contest between labor and management. This is a contest between a small group of men and their government. The next day in Congress, he asks for the power to draft the railroad men into the army and force them back to work. As a part of this temporary emergency legislation, I request the Congress immediately to authorize the President to draft into the armed forces of the United States all workers who are on strike against their government. Word has just been received that the royal strike has been settled on terms proposed by the President. Labor leaders are disillusioned and angry, and they turn on Harry Truman. The Brotherhood of Railroad Trainmen <clears throat> called off the strike at 4 p.m. this afternoon because of the high pressure methods employed by the President of the United States in his address to the American people last evening. The CIO calls him the nation's number one strike breaker. His popularity, which had reached a peak on VJ Day, begins to fade. The congressional elections in 1946 clearly show the sentiment of the nation swinging away from Harry Truman and the Democratic Party. In state after state, Democratic members of the House and Senate are defeated. The 80th Congress convenes. And to Harry Truman, the Republican-controlled legislature is an enemy camp. Troubled by the emerging pattern of Soviet aggression in Greece and Turkey, the president outlines a plan for aiding and strengthening these two countries. Greece must have assistance if it is to become a self-supporting and self-respecting democracy. I therefore ask the Congress to provide authority for assistance to Greece and Turkey in the amount of $400 million for the period ending June 30th, 1948. The Truman Doctrine is one of the few bills Harry Truman can get through the legislature. At a political dinner in the spring of 1948, Harry Truman experiments with delivering off-the-cuff talks, and observers are impressed by what they call a new fighting Truman style. The Democratic Convention opens in Philadelphia in July of 1948. Behind the carnival atmosphere, there is a current of discontent. Dwight Eisenhower has been approached by high-ranking Democrats to be their presidential nominee, but he has turned them down. Now there is a feeling in the Democratic Party that they are stuck with Harry Truman. And then an open fight at the convention over another issue makes things even worse. The civil rights fight between Northern and Southern Democrats breaks into the open. Paraphrasing the language of the great commoner of a generation ago, you shall not crucify the South on this cross of civil rights. The revolt of the Southern Democrats is climaxed by this declaration from the chairman of the Alabama delegation. Chairman, 13 of the 14 delegates proceed to walk out of this convention and return to Alabama, and we bid you goodbye. Harry 
courtroom and watches the convention from his Washington office. He knows that all the fight, all the excitement has gone out of the delegates. That something must be done to sweep away the gloom brought on by the Southern Revolt. The Republicans, you know, are expected to nominate a candidate for president. <coughs> They're having a lot of trouble deciding on just who that candidate for president will be and for just what he stands. <laughs> I'll say to you that for the next four years, you'll be a Democrat in the White House and you're looking at him. <laughs> such importance and urgency. I am therefore calling this Congress back into session on the 26th of July. Now, my friends, if there's any reality behind that Republican platform, we ought to get some action out of the short session of the 80th Congress. They could do this job in 15 days if they wanted to do it. This but even his staunchest supporters doubt that Truman can fulfill his promise. The campaign he is about to launch, this fight for his political life, will be a new chapter in Harry Truman's 